As we have discussed the heavens over these last many months, we have made the journey from a view of a cosmos exhibiting unchanging cycles of change based on eternal constant motions of spheres to a profoundly more dynamic view of a solar system filled with a multitude of bodies traveling through a mostly empty void on paths dictated by mathematically expressed laws of nature and a force known as gravitation. We have discarded the crystalline spheres that once held things in place and, in doing so, opened up unimaginably vast expanses between the stars now recognized to be like our sun in many ways, each moving according to the same laws and forces that pull the planets in their orbits around the sun and the various satellite moon in their orbits around their myriad planets. At first, those stars were thought to remain stationary in space, as if hung like ornaments on a Christmas tree. But soon, men like Halley showed that they moved through the vast distances that separated them. Still though, even with all of this change, it was thought that the stars themselves were uniform and unchanging. While somewhat quaint to think about now, this holdover from astronomy's earliest days of supposing uniformity held that all stars were more or less exactly like our sun, with differences in brightness coming from one star being further from the observer than another. Moreover, it was thought that a star remained a constant brightness, never growing brighter or dimmer, at least in most cases. There was one obvious exception, the ghoul. Al Gaul had perplexed observers for millennia, earning the name the Demon Star due to its confounding astronomers since at least the time of the ancient Egyptians. The Greeks associated it with the Gorgons, of whom Medusa was one, while in Islam, the culture from which we derive our common name for this second brightest star in the constellation of Perseus, it is called the Ghoul or Evil Spirit. The star acquired this significance because it was known to dim significantly every couple of days before brightening again. Taking about eight hours to go through this cycle of dimming, it seemed to give lie to the ancient beliefs of a perfect, unchanging universe, and so was considered evil and unsettling by those who watched it, an ill omen. Yet, during the period of the scientific revolution, there were those willing to study the demon star to learn of its behavior. In 1667, there was the Italian astronomer, Montanari, who noted its variability in his writings, though he does not seem to have made an attempt to characterize it numerically. That would have to wait another century when the British duo of Edward Pigot and the deaf and mute savant, John Goodrick, turned their telescope to the object and in 1782 characterized the regularity of its behavior. Their observations showed that the star would dim once every two days and 21 hours. For most of that time, the star's brightness would remain constant, but at the end of the cycle, it would slowly dim over the course of four hours, and then remain at that dimmer state for just 20 minutes. Then, it would brighten again slowly over the course of the next four hours, back to its original luminosity. It was good Rick who had proposed that the star might have a unseen, dark companion that orbited the star and blocked its light for a short time as it swung between the ghoul and the earthbound observer. For this insight, Goodrick would be awarded the Copley Medal by the Royal Society. A century later, in 1881, Edward Charles Pickering of the Harvard Observatory would offer a refinement of Goodrick's idea. He suggested that the darker object was, in fact, another, dimmer star, a hypothesis that was confirmed by the German astrophysicist Hermann Karl Vogel eight years later in 1889. By this time, the study of variable stars had risen from something that was little more than a curiosity to the forefront of astronomical interest, at least in some circles. While others were pursuing the secrets of spectra and stellar evolution, the staff of the Harvard College Observatory began a cataloging project that would not only document an untold number of previously rare variable stars, but find in those cycles of brightening and dimming 
a way to determine the distance to stars unimaginably far away. This tool, soon used by a man some now refer to as the second Copernicus, would shatter the last vestiges of humanity's conceit that the earth occupied a special place in the cosmos, and would also expand our horizons farther than he had thought possible even a generation earlier. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 37, Variable Stars and Levitt's Law. Henrietta Swan Levitt was born on July 4th, 1868, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the daughter of Reform Minister George Roswell Levitt. The Levitt family had deep roots in the professional world of the greater Boston area, counting among their ancestors the Deacon John Levitt who had settled in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the early 17th century. And as such, there was a valuing of education and learning that by the middle of the 19th century extended to the daughters of those families well off enough to afford the tuition. Henrietta's uncle, Erasmus Darwin Levitt, was a renowned naturalist and physician. Named for the famous English physician who would be the grandfather of one Charles Darwin, this Erasmus would become president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and would gain fame for inventing the Levitt engine that powered Boston's Chestnut Hill Water Station. While still a teenager, the family would move to the boom town of Cleveland, Ohio, and at age 16, Henrietta would enroll at Oberlin College, first to take preparatory courses and then to complete the first two years of a college curriculum. Following this, Likely due to the influence of her uncle, she returned to Cambridge to enroll in what was known as the Society for the Collegiate Instruction for Women, now called Ratcliffe College. While there, she would take a typical liberal arts course of study with an emphasis in classics, though she did study physics for a year and take a course in differential calculus. Only in her senior year did she take a course in astronomy taught by one of the staff astronomers from the Harvard College Observatory. Graduating from Radcliffe in 1892 with a women's equivalent of a Harvard baccalaureate degree, she transitioned fairly seamlessly to the observatory and university. Being more or less of independent means, she was able to take some graduate courses related to astronomy as well as begin working at the observatory as an unpaid calculator. When Levitt arrived at the observatory, she was assigned a place in an ongoing project under the supervision of Williamina Fleming. The determination of stellar magnitudes from photographic plates taken by Solon Bailey at Harvard's Arequipa station in Peru. Specifically, Levitt was to look for the stars whose brightnesses changed over time. This project of documenting variable stars had grown out of Edward Pickering's photometry project, instituted when he was first appointed the observatory's director. At the time of his hiring, the number of known variable stars had grown from just Algol and the wondrous star in the constellation of the whale known as Miraceti, first observed in 1595 by David Fabricius and better characterized by the Dutch astronomer Phocyclides Hawarda in 1638, to about 200 or so different examples. While some of these variable stars showed changes in their brightness that were consistent with the idea of having an eclipsing companion, Others were less easy to explain, much less characterized. At this point, it is probably necessary to introduce some science-specific terminology, and that is something known as a light curve. 
When an astronomer measures the brightness of an object in the sky, he or she is, she is getting a single data point of how much light is being received at the observation place. As we've mentioned in previous episodes, this is usually characterized on the apparent magnitude scale first put forward by the Hellenistic astronomer Hipparchus and more rigorously formalized by Pogson. This measurement is actually a good bit more complicated than just looking up and saying that the object is about, oh, I don't know, this bright. Adjustments have to be made for the object's position in the sky due to the effect of the atmosphere's absorption of light, as well as changes in observing conditions, such as the presence of light clouds and such. Making these adjustments was the work of many of the calculators at the Harvard Observatory. Just as importantly, though, is to get a sense of how these measurements of brightness changed over time. This was first done for planets whose brightness changes depending on the angle the planet makes with the imaginary line connecting the Earth and the Sun. But with the slow recognition that stars change their brightness as well, it became a passion of Pickering's to characterize just how that change took place. If one makes measurements of a star's brightness over time, one can come up with an approximation of the continuous change of how much light is received from the star as that function of time. This is known as what's called the light curve, since the data is usually represented on a graph with the star's apparent magnitude on the vertical or y-axis, and the time being represented on the horizontal or x-axis. As the star's brightness is plotted, it will often show a repeating, periodic pattern of brightness, the period of which can be determined from the curve by looking at the data points on the graph itself. As with so many of the other things we've discussed, this is a fairly simple thing in concept, but it's actually a lot harder to do than you might think. Let's take alcohol, for example. As we said in the introduction, the period of the light curve is 2 days and 21 hours. For 2 days and 13 hours, the apparent magnitude is steady until the star begins to dim over the course of those 4 hours. Now, let's say you're observing that dimming beginning at 10 p.m. one given evening. That event will occur over 8 hours and 20 minutes until the star returns to its usual brightness at, say, 6.20 a.m. or so. Figuring this out can be hard because the sun might be getting close to the horizon by that time and so the brightness of the sky will begin to change. In addition, the star during that entire time is moving across the sky and so how much light the atmosphere is absorbing is actually changing a little bit as well. The bigger problem will be that the next time the divvying occurs will be about two, hour, two days later at about 7 p.m., which you might have a hard time seeing as the sun might just then be setting. The next event will take two days after that at 4 p.m. when the star is hidden during the daytime. As you can imagine, due to the cycles of light and dark, measuring a full light curve for a star can be very much a challenge due to the gaps in the data created by various factors such as, you know, when the sun's up or the brightness of the moon or having clouds or whatever the case may be. Nevertheless, by 1890 or so, some 200 stars were known to be variable when Pickering made it a priority not only to attempt to determine which stars were variable, but also to start characterizing the light curves of as many of those as was practical. This work was originally started with the Williamina Fleming working with the Harvard Sky Survey plates. As she worked with both the spectra of various stars and the brightness estimates, she began to get a sense of the types of spectra that indicated the possibility of a star being variable. In other words, she could sort of look at the spectra and say, gee, whenever I see the spectrum with these kinds of lines, that spectrum is usually associated with a variable star. And so if she saw that kind of a spectrum on a plate, she would go, ah, that might be a variable star. She could then look back through the accumulating catalog of the observatory to determine if the star's brightness was in fact changing over time. While this often meant that there wasn't enough data to arrive at a full light curve, at least at first, Fleming could document the magnitude range in many cases and thus establish the star for further research. Using this method, Fleming would identify over 20 new variables within the first couple of years of the project, which was a record at the time. And in the decade of the 1890s, over a total of 100 more of these would be discovered. No one, however, could have predicted the flood of new data that was to come. 
As a result of this accumulation of variable stars, Pickering decided to classify them into five different types. The first were stars that flared to become much brighter in a very short time and then slowly faded, and that occurrence would happen usually just once. In other words, what we're talking about here is what we've called a nova or new star in several of our earlier episodes. For Pickering, nova represented sort of an ultimate type of variable star. Type 2 variables were stars whose brightness changed in a cyclical fashion over a long period of time, usually one or two years. Pickering would assign these to be monitored by a group of amateur astronomers he recruited through the various popular astronomy journals published in the United States at the time, an early example of what is now commonly called citizen science. Type 3 were stars that underwent only very slight changes that were nearly undetectable through small telescopes and thus could only be studied at larger observatories with equipment specifically designed to help compare and measure magnitudes such as those possessed at Harvard. Type 4 variables were those stars which varied continuously over short periods. And finally, there were Pickering's Type 5 stars, which were really those stars that were eclipsing binary systems, much like alcohol. One thing that should be understood here is that aside from the Type 5 variables, no one had any sort of good ideas as to why the brightness of these objects might change, at least in the 1890s. Pickering's goal as was almost always the case with any of these kinds of projects, at least initially, was to gather as much data as possible to create a natural history, such as had been the case with the stellar spectra classification schemes that had been developed there at the observatory, and now these different types of variable star classes. The only thing that could be said for sure was that the Class I nova stars, based on the few spectra that were taken of them, showed the release of an enormous amount of hydrogen. This was an early piece of evidence for the composition of stars that, unfortunately, would be overlooked for many years as there was no context in which to place it. The floodgates on variable stars really opened when the plates began arriving from Harvard's Arequipa station once Solon Bailey took over the directorship of the facility. Upon his arrival in the Peruvian highlands, Bailey found himself becoming more and more fascinated with a type of deep sky object known as a globular cluster. For much of the period of early telescopic observing, these objects had been seen as fuzzy patches or blobs of light in the night sky, and they had engendered a great deal of speculation and debate on whether they consisted of luminous gas, or if they were conglomerations of many stars seen from such a distance that the individual members of the cluster were indistinguishable. As telescopes became better instruments in many different ways, with better glass, larger primary optical elements, and the introduction of photographic techniques, these objects revealed themselves to be accumulations of not just hundreds or thousands of stars, but rather tens or even hundreds of thousands of stars. A common metaphor for such objects is to think of them as immense swarms of stellar bees all orbiting some hidden center. Given the exceptional seeing conditions available to him, Bailey began to really study these objects for the first time beyond noting where they were. He was able to take clear, multiple hour exposure photographs of them in order to bring out the multitude of stars, especially near the edges of the cluster where they could be more easily distinguished. As the photographic plates were shipped back to Cambridge in the United States, Fleming began to pour over them and soon found the first variable star in a cluster located in the constellation of the Centaur. A few days later, Pickering, taking his turn in examining the plates, found another. Before long, variables were being discovered at an almost unheard of rate. As a side note here, in late 1893 and early 1894, Peru went through one of its frequent political upheavals, and for a time, Bailey and his family, along with the observatory staff, had to deal with revolutionaries that sought to establish their candidate for president by force. On one occasion, Bailey and his family were taken prisoner on a train, fortunately to be released a few days later. And at another time, the lenses and measuring equipment were removed from the observing station's telescopes and buried, lest they fall into the wrong hands and end up being sold on the black market. 
While, do, while the doing of astronomy usually involves late nights and cold conditions, there have been those times when its pursuit took those who practiced it into harm's way. In 1895, Bailey returned to Cambridge to accompany the newly arrived Bruce Telescope, that masterpiece of design and construction that Pickering had christened, quote, the finest photographic telescope in the world, end quote, back to Peru. And after a lot of work to overcome the various idiosyncrasies of the instrument, he began taking plates with it as well. So solid were the mounts for the Bruce and other telescopes at Arequipa that they all survived unscathed the fairly major earthquake that struck the region on June 15th of 1896. These trials of fire passed, the output of the Arequipa station more than doubled, and the photographs taken with the telescope endowed by Catherine Bruce were, in terms of quality, beyond anything ever seen at Harvard. I can scarcely imagine the wonder that Pickering, Fleming, and the rest of the 40 or so calculators, half of whom were women, felt when they saw the quality of those first photographic plates arrive. By 1897, from these plates, Williamina Fleming would discover another 78 variable stars. One of these women, who had recently been brought on as a calculator, was the recently graduated Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who had become aware of the work of the observatory through having taken that astronomy class from the institution's deputy director, George Mary Seal. Seal was Pickering's right-hand man to the observatory, and he had been named Phillips Professor of Astronomy at Radcliffe. Seeing in Levitt the type of attention to detail and curious minds so valued among those who had to examine the plates, Seal recommended that she be brought on in 1895, and she would be followed by Annie Jump Cannon a year later. It was during this time that Henrietta Levitt began to lose her hearing for reasons I've not really been able to pin down. However, in a remarkable turn of good fortune, at least for Miss Levitt, Annie Cannon had lost her hearing due to an infection of scarlet fever some years earlier, and so Cannon was able to, over the next few years, help Levitt learn the skills needed to thrive in spite of her disability. In fact, while I would imagine that neither woman would have desired the hearing impairment happened, the deafness they both experienced may have helped them in the sometimes tedious and detail-oriented work of examining and analyzing the photographic plates they were assigned. The first task Levitt was assigned was to use the photographic plates taken in Cambridge using the 8 and 11 inch telescopes there to corroborate the visual assessment of stellar brightness that had been going on for a number of years. During an exposure, the size of a star which, by the way, looked negative, black, against the clear emulsion on the glass plate, would be bigger the brighter the star was. However, since each telescope gathered a different amount of light given the size of its objective element, the stellar brightness of the stars couldn't be compared directly to each other or to the visual estimate of the magnitude that had been arrived at, say, by an observer using the great refractor. What Pickering asked Levitt to do, under the supervision of Williamina Fleming, was develop a system of determining magnitudes by comparing the relative brightnesses of many stars on each plate. This process involved, along with other things, comparing the stars on the plates to one or more of a group of 16 Type II long-period variable stars, whose light curves were well characterized, that resided in the northern region of the sky, and thus they appeared in the plates taken every night there at the observatory. By comparing stellar images on the plates with the images of the variables and with each other, Levitt could arrive at very accurate and consistent estimations of apparent magnitude. It was also in this way that she would become intimately familiar with the variable stars that formed the foundation of her system, something that would serve her in good stead soon enough. In 1896, Levitt would also train Cannon in her technique, though not with the goal of having the newer hire a sister in the calculator room. Instead, since Cannon had worked with the telescope at her undergraduate institution, Wellesley, under the tutelage of one of Pickering's most successful female students, one Sarah Frances Whiting, she was given the task of observing certain variable stars nightly through one of the observatory's telescopes in order to more accurately determine their light curves. And by the way, as near as I've been able to find, she's the first woman at Harvard ever to do this. 
And as an aside, we'll take a look at Annie Jump Cannon's remarkable life in a later supplemental episode. And so let me just say here that her journey from being an astronomy student at an all-women's college to joining the group at Harvard was one filled with tragedy, heartbreak, depression, and in time, rebirth in the work being done at what was, at that time anyway, one of the world's most foremost scientific institutions. While not taking data on variable stars, Cannon worked in the calculation room, analyzing the spectra of stars taken in Peru in order to extend Mina Fleming's Draper catalog, an effort we've discussed in a previous episode. All of this work, conducted under the direction of Pickering, would result in his being awarded a second gold medal from the Royal Astronomical Society, this time for the study of variable stars. It was clear that at this point, the Harvard College Observatory was leaps and bounds ahead of any other similar institution in the study of these types of objects. In the presentation of the prize, special mention was made about the support provided by Anna Draper for the projects of the observatory noting that such progress would not have been possible without the resources she had made available. Additionally, the work of Mina Fleming was singled out among, quote, Pickering's ladies' assistants as being, quote, that most careful observer, end quote, for her many discoveries. While the scientific institutions of Europe would not hire women, at least those of a British persuasion, perhaps on account of the work of Carolyn Herschel and Margaret Huggins, were willing to acknowledge the efforts of those doing exceptional work abroad. Throughout the first decade of the 20th century, measurements of variable stars continued to be made in order to more fully establish the light curves of as many as possible to see if they were indeed regular and determine which is Pickering's classifications they should be placed into. Many of these were done by Miss Cannon at the 6-inch telescope in the observatory's west wing. Others were made by Leon Campbell, who worked outside the dome there with a 5-inch instrument. For the truly subtle shifts in brightness, Oliver Wendell deployed, deployed the observatory's latest photometer to make measurements as precise as 3 one hundredths of a magnitude. Even Pickering still regularly made measurements of brightness, recording his one billionth data point on May 23rd of 1903 from that very instrument. Moreover, all around the country, there were those trained to make variable star observations who had been assigned targets by Pickering and who sent their data back to Harvard on a regular basis. In time, this network would be even more formally organized to become the AAVSO, or American Association of Variable Star Observers. Tracking the changes of brightness of the stars they were assigned, these amateurs, though that term may only apply in the sense that they were really never paid for their work, added to the data that Pickering hoped would one day reveal the causes of each star's variability, even as those reasons remained elusive. From this data, as well as from that being gathered by other observatories around the world, Miss Cannon began to keep a card catalog of every variable star known along with what was known about it. By 1900, the catalog had over 20,000 entries. In 1903, this was turned into a series of tables and published so that anyone could access the data gathered up to that point. Titled, quote, a provisional catalog of variable stars, end quote, this opus contained everything that was known about some 1,227 variable stars, including their position in the sky and name, the stellar classification of the star, its minimum and maximum brightness, its period of variability, and, when appropriate, its Pickering classification. As you might imagine, it was immediately popular within the broad astronomical and astrophysical community. Interestingly, more than half of the stars in the catalog fell into Pickering's Type II classification with periods of oscillation of over a year. In that same year, Henrietta Leavitt returned to work at the observatory. After her initial time there, she had left to take a tour of Europe and had worked for a time as an art assistant at Beloit College in Wisconsin. But the allure of the skies and the work of the observatory called her back. Pickering had offered her a salary of 30 cents an hour when she had written to find out if there might be a place for her there, and she jumped at it. Upon returning, her first project was to examine the stars of the Orion Nebula. First photographed by Henry Draper, the nebula had recently been closely studied by Max Wolf of the Heidelberg Observatory. 
Wolf had found that many of the nebulous stars were variables, and Pickering had decided to more completely characterize the periods and magnitude changes of those stars. With the meticulous and talented Levitt back on the staff, Pickering felt he had the tools and personnel to tackle that challenge. Over the course of the previous 10 years, the telescopes at Cambridge and Arequipa had taken several long exposure plates of the nebula. Armed with these, Levitt ventured into the thicket of stars hoping to tease out the magnitudes of each with the hope of finding the minimum and maximum brightnesses as well as those periods of variability. Using an ingenious tool of her own devising, a small rectangle that contained pictures of comparison stars at various magnitudes for each telescope used, something that she called her fly spanker on account that it was too small to be referred to as a true fly swatter, the thing that it most closely resembled. She was able to confirm 16 of Wolf's variables and identify more than 50 more. At this point, Levitt hit on another idea that would prove even more useful in her quest to gather data. She had the observatory's master photographer, Edward King, make a single positive plate with white stars against a gray background from one of the many negative plates of the nebula. She then placed each negative plate on the positive plate and then examined the overlaid pair with a magnifying glass. If a star didn't change in brightness, the positive and negative image more or less canceled each other out by producing a gray combination that faded into that gray background of the positive plate. Stars that changed their brightness, however, didn't do this and so stood out against the gray background, making them easy to identify and measure. And I want to pause here for just a moment to recognize just how very clever this idea is. The reason you know it's clever is that it seems so obvious as we now explain it. But then you realize that the observatory had been taking photographic plates for about 15 years up to this point, and no one else had ever thought about this kind of an idea. So, all in all, it's pretty genius if you ask me. Anyway, Levitt immediately found another eight variables in the nebula, and over the course of the next few months found another 77. In other words, in just three months, in just one nebula, Henrietta Levitt had found over 130 variable stars. With these methods in hand, she moved on to other targets, most notably something known as the Magellanic Clouds. When Magellan and his crew circumnavigated the globe in 1520, their captain, still being alive at the point, had noted the presence in the southern sky of two luminous clouds in the nighttime heavens. Consisting of what looked to be thousands of individual stars, these clouds had been photographed extensively by the instruments in Arequipa. Levitt quickly found 200 more variables between the two clouds in a somewhat cursory survey before focusing in on the smaller of the two known, appropriately, as the small Magellanic Clouds. In 1905 alone, Levitt would find over 900 variables there. So prodigious was she that the Princeton astronomer Charles Young would write Pickering, quote, What a variable star fiend Miss Levitt is. One can't keep up with the role of new discoveries, unquote. Anna Draper, for her part, would write to applaud, quote, the large number of variables in the small Magellanic cloud. It is certainly strange that so many of them should fi be found, apparently, so close together. Will you please congratulate Miss Levitt for me, end quote. Most of these variables were Pickering's type 4, with short periods and small changes in magnitude. We now call these Cepheid variables. This led to a new approach to photographing the clouds, one that allowed taking a number of successive short exposures which captured the stars as a series of dots on a single plate so that the changes in brightness which happened so quickly could be more easily compared. As these new methods of finding and characterizing variable stars were perfected, so long suggested to Pickering that it was time to issue a call for the observatories of the world to enter into a coordinated effort to find as many as possible of these variable stars without duplicating each other's efforts. Pickering concurred with this idea and in 1906 issued just such a call to set up a project. Knowing that such an agreement would take some time to reach, he asked Miss Cannon and another calculator, Miss Evelyn Leland, who had long assisted Solon Bailey with the plates he took, to join Miss Levitt in her work. 
He then divided the sky into some 55 or so sections and split them up somewhat randomly so that each observer, or I should say each calculator, had regions in the sky in all different parts. They were then given four negative plates taken at different times for each region, as well as one positive plate for comparison. While this only allowed for identification of the variability of a star, it was what could be done given the resources available. Variables could be found and cataloged for later investigation when warranted. In 1907, Annie Jump Cannon updated her variable star publication with a, quote, second catalog of variable stars, focusing mostly on long period type 2 variables. Miss Levitt's short period type 4 stars would be published in a separate catalog in the following year. During this time, Mina Fleming found another 19 variables using her method of examining stellar spectra, providing more proof that there were spectral similarities among many of these sorts of stars. She published her third paper on the topic, titled, quote, A Photographic Study of Variable Stars, end quote, that laid out her methodology for others to use along with her now 200-plus identifications. Following this, she undertook the hard work of developing light curves for each one using the long history of the Harvard plates. Pickering hoped that these data would someday come to underlie the determination of all photographic magnitudes of variable stars. And even as he worked towards these ends, Levitt continued her work of finding variable stars, adding 56 during the year of 1908. Beyond this, her project of publishing the data on the short-term variables reached fruition, and in the paper she included a total number of about 1,777, each with a minimum and maximum brightness, along with whatever stellar classifications as had been determined. As this went to press, Levitt began the work of characterizing the complete light curves of as many of the stars as she could. As she worked through the first dozen or so, she began to notice something. In the report she filed with uh, Pickering discussing her work, she wrote, quote, It is worthy of notice that the brighter variables have longer periods. End quote. Now, 12 stars is hardly a representative sample, but the trend was certainly interesting. And as she added four more light curves to her tally, she found that they, too, nicely fit in the pattern. This was really starting to look like something. It was at this point, though, in the cold and wet winter of Boston, that she came down with a serious illness that was bad enough to require her hospitalization. For most of the month of December, she remained there until she was well enough to travel home to Wisconsin to recuperate. Her work would have to wait until she was well enough to resume the effort and the focus required, something that was not a given in turn-of-the-century America. It would be more than a year before Henrietta Leavitt was well enough again to resume her work. While still not strong enough to travel, she wrote Pickering in January of 1910 to see if there was some way she could return to the analysis of plate at her parents' home in Beloit. Sending her a setup identical to those used in the calculation room, Pickering had her work on stars near the North Pole. At first, she was only able to work for two or three hours a day, but her strength returned fairly quickly and in May she returned to the observatory boarding with her uncle in Cambridge. The stay was unfortunately short as she was obliged to travel once again to Beloit at the death of her father in March of 1911, spending the spring and summer of that year there. Finally, back at the observatory in the fall of 1911, she once again took up the question of the variable stars in the small Magellanic cloud. Solon Bailey had put forward the idea that the clouds were not just apparent structures. In other words, they weren't just randomly distributed stars that just happened to be clustered along a line of sight, but rather they were, in fact, enormous conglomerations of stars that were separate from the Milky Way galaxy itself. This was a pretty bold assertion, but it got Levitt thinking about what she was observing. Since no parallax could be observed for any of the stars in the cloud, that meant that they had to be pretty far away. 
Levitt reasoned that if the clouds were structures like large star clusters, that meant that the stars were going to be all about the same distance from the sun. An example of this of more terrestrial nature would be for me to sort of assume that all the people living in Los Angeles are all about the same distance away from Atlanta near where I live. Now, they're not all going to be the exact same distance from me, of course, but the difference of a couple dozen kilometers from one side of the urban area to the other aren't going to matter much when the total distance from me to them is on the order of 4,000 kilometers. What this told Levitt was that if a star looked brighter, in other words, a star that are, that's there in the small Magellanic cloud looked brighter, or to put it in astronomical terms, if it had a brighter apparent magnitude, that meant the, the star probably had a brighter absolute magnitude as well, even if she couldn't directly measure that. So what this meant was that she actually really had a real physical relationship on her hands. In other words, she was looking at stars all the same distance away, which meant that if they looked brighter, they were brighter. And so, if she could find more stars that could be shown to match the pattern she already had seen in the 16 light curves she had analyzed before her illness, if she could add to that, she may not have something. Returning to the plates, she tracked the output of another nine stars and found that they too followed the relationship that being brighter meant that they had longer oscillation periods. She then plotted the period lengths on the x-axis of a graph and the minimum maximum and maximum brightnesses on the y-axis of that same graph. What she found was a curved line that was fairly smooth. And this clearly indicated that there might actually be some sort of relationship. With this indication that she was on the right track, she replotted the data, this time with the vertical scale using a logarithmic progression rather than a linear one. And this is an old trick that allows a scientist to tease out the relationship between two physical variables if the dependent variable relies on the independent variable according to some sort of an exponential power in the equation. When she did this, she was rewarded with a progression of the data that more or less fell along a straight line with the slope of the line indicating the exponent in the power law relationship between the brightness or magnitude and the period. As Pickering would write in his announcement of the result in the Harvard College Observatory Circular, it was a quote-unquote remarkable result. All of the data taken had produced a physical law between two variables of these oscillating stellar systems. In other words, if you knew the period of a type 4 variable star, you knew what its brightness or apparent magnitude would be, even without having to measure it. Today, many astronomers call this the period-luminosity relationship, but recently there has been a movement to rename it as Levitt's Law, an effort this podcast is more than happy to support. So apart from the fact that Henrietta Levitt discovered a new physical law, why is this such an important announcement? Well, it has to do with what you can do with this law. While Levitt's data was based on apparent magnitudes and the assumption that the stars being examined were all about the same distance away, it didn't really tell us how far away all those stars were actually at. To be able to do that, one needed a star whose distance and magnitude was known that these stars could be compared to. In other words, Let's say you have a type 4 variable star that you know the distance to and you have both its apparent magnitude and its period measurement. By knowing the distance, you can calculate the absolute magnitude or luminosity of the star. This one measurement allows you to calibrate Levitt's law so that you can know the absolute magnitude of any star at any given point on the graph. Once you do that, you can look at the apparent magnitude of the stars in the small Magellanic Cloud and using their absolute magnitudes from the law, find their distances. The first person to actually do this was our Danish friend from a few episodes ago, Enyar Hertzsprung. While his path to the conclusion was a bit more complicated than what we've described here, the differences are mostly technical. He identified a dozen or more variables of type 4 from across the Milky Way and found their distances, thus allowing for a calibration of the relationship that was actually stronger than what we've already described. When he used the relationship and did that calculation comparing the, what should have been the absolute magnitudes and the observed apparent magnitudes, he came up with a really stunning result. 
The stars in the small Magellanic Cloud were some 37,000 light years from the Earth. Either the Milky Way galaxy was a lot bigger than everyone thought, or Solon Bailey was right about their position outside of it. It was a result that would soon be bolstered by additional work from Henry Norris Russell. From this application, it became apparent that astronomers now had a new tool to measure the distances to stars. In time, it would be used to fundamentally alter our understanding of the cosmos. So important would this work be that Edwin Hubble would regularly claim that Levitt deserved the Nobel Prize in Physics for her work. For her part, though, Levitt did not follow up on her research in this area. Instead, she continued to hunt for new variables and work on fine-tuning the process by which photographic magnitudes were determined until her untimely death from cancer in 1921. She was 53 years old. This brings us to the end of this episode of the podcast, but not the end of the story of variable stars. Next week, we'll take some time to understand how Edward Pickering's successor as the director of Harbor's observatory would use Levitt's discovery to follow in the footsteps of Nicholas Copernicus and once again move the Earth away from the center of the universe. As we wrap things up for today, let me offer my customary shout out to some of the crew. For all of you listening in the City of Angels, it's great to have you as part of our group. Whether you found out about us from longtime supporter of the show, Dr. Eric Sherry, or through some other source, welcome aboard. If you've got a little bit of time, why not send us a photo of you at one of the amazing scientific sites out there in Southern California? Maybe the Griffiths Observatory, maybe Mount Wilson, maybe Palomar. You can post it to our Facebook page. We'd love to see you guys doing your thing out there. For everyone else, let me once again extend my thanks to you all from across the globe who tune in each week to join in the journey. I'm honored that you give us a little bit of your time each week. I hope that you find it well spent. I also want to take some time to thank the musicians of the Blue Dot Sessions for allowing us to use their amazing compositions, and I hope you'll take a moment to check out their work at www.sessions.blue. Finally, if you're so inclined, please take a moment to let someone know about the podcast. We've always got room for more crew, and the best way to recruit is by word of mouth. Also, if you haven't already done it, we'd really love, you, love to have you post a strong review of the podcast on whatever site you're using to listen to the show. It moves us up in the various Hot 100 lists, or whatever they're called, and it gets more people to learn about what we're doing. Anything you can do would be great. Until next time, full sails on your journey.